Hi, I'm Jamie, Port Vancouver Regional Library's Experiential Learning Librarian. The Public Library is pleased to partner with the Cowlitz Indian Tribe to offer this workshop on beginning beading, led by Tribal Elder Patty Kinswa Geyser. The Cowlitz Indian Tribe ancestral land includes the library service area of Southwest Washington. Patty Kinswa Geyser, an elder member of the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, serves as the Tribal Council Chairwoman in addition to several other boards and committees. Patty is tied in a palm cowlitz, which means upper cowlitz, and originates in eastern Lewis County to Cowlitz Prairie at Toledo, Washington. Her passion is her family, with one daughter and one son, who have given her five grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Since her retirement from the Cowlitz Indian Tribe as the Elders Program Manager, she still enjoys helping others and works with the Chemical Dependency Department mental health group, and healing of the canoe youth program. Teaching cultural education for mentoring is a big part of her teachings. Cultural education includes classes in drum making, beading, medicine bags, working with cedar, just to name a few, along with oral history of her family and tribe. It is my great pleasure to have the opportunity to sit down with Patty and work on this beginner beading project as well as learn more about the Cowlitz tribe and how Patty continues to give back to her community through education, resource sharing, and compassion. Thank you for uh, being so flexible and meeting with me this way. I'm sorry it's been so weird. Well, I just, I just hope that we can get it done. <laughs> oh yeah, no worries, this will be great. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record this Zoom session with us. And then I'm also recording like a top down while I'm working on the project with you. And then so we can kind of cut in back and then I'll edit it together. So it cuts. Oh, in that's how you got your phone up there to record. Yes. I was yes. wondering about that. Cause so I made one like this. <gasps> it's so pretty. And oh. the one we're going to make today, I made one. Perfect. As a Ooh. sample. And then I made one pair without bugle beads with just beads. Oh, I like that one too. They're That's like great. a small, like a little tiny short. It's not a number three. I don't know what size. Of, it's like a square bead, but it's glit glitzy and yellow. So just yellow it, and red on that one. It but looks I so thought great. We would, we would make the other earring to this today. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. That's what we're doing. Okay. First you get thread. It's a little little over a foot long. I like to have extra thread. And I run it through the wax. This is beeswax. And you take your thread and you just run your thread through the beeswax just like that. Do you run it like once or twice or a few times? You can like do it practicing. twice. And okay. that coats the thread so it slides and it also coats it so the thread doesn't get cut through. So okay. you have your, I have a size 12 long needle. It's mm -hmm. threaded and waxed. And the first thing I do is pick up the big bead. If you see the big bead that's on the top of the earring, mm -hmm. you pick that up first and you take it all the way down until you have about that much left at the end. Okay. Now, because I had the red as the main color of the earring, I'm going to pick up three red beads with my needle. Through your big bead, you pick up three size 11 beads, and then you go through your earring hoop. There's a little hoop on the end of the earring finding. Mm -hmm. And then you put on three more red beads or main color beads. And then you're gonna go back down through that big, big bead that you started with.
And there should be three beads on each side of your earring hoop, just like this. Beautiful. Okay. Okay, okay, then for my main color bead, I picked up 12. I'm using red in this case. Pick up 12 beads with your with your needle. So when you say pick up, do you mean, do you put like 12 of them on the needle and then push them all down the thread at the same time? Yes, yes. See, okay. they're like this. Perfect, and I, okay. And what I do, whatever color I'm using, I just put a pile of beads on the bead pad. Okay. And when we're done, we'll put them back in each of their containers. So I have. Directions. And then accent will be, I have on this one, little clear white beads. Okay. And one gold bead. I have three accent and one gold bead how do you choose the colors for your beads i just see them in my head but there's if a person got interested in making earrings you can graduate from this type to any type there's uh the website called pinterest type in beaded earrings and you'll get thousands of designs And then one bugle bead. Now you're down to the bottom of your earring. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna repeat it in reverse. So we'll pick up three of the white accent and one gold. When you get your 12 beads on, you know, you can lay your beads on um, and then just use your needle to pick them up. Oh, look at you. You're less apt to poke your fingers. <laughs> look at how much easier that is. I think these are going to be really great. I have some friends that will really enjoy these. Yeah, it is a relaxing thing to do. And after a while, if someone does beading, they can make up their own designs. I do okay. um, a lot of Seahawk colors. <laughs> it's a good combination. It's a good team. I, good I do uh, beaded, beaded ornament covers. Oh, that, cool. That's another thing you can find either books on or find it on Pinterest. <laughs> okay, now you have the 12 on. Now you're going to go through that first big bead that you picked up at the very first. And you're going to go through the three beads, through the hoop, and back down through the three beads. That's what makes your hoop. That strengthens it. Every time we put a, a, a earring hoop loop on, we'll go through those beads. It'll just strengthen because that's a part that will be pulling, you know, the weight of the beads will be on that. So you want to go through that. Go through the hoop and back down through the three and back down through the big bead. All right, from there. Okay, now you've gone back down through and you're back down to the bottom of the big bead again. So you are going to repeat exactly the same thing that you did on the first loop. You'll count your beads exactly the same. And when you get through, you go back up through the big bead and back down again. So by the time you have your one earring done, the second earring should be super fast. It, it is. This is, I call my five minute earrings. Ooh, I, love I do it. a lot of these, um, like in our tribe, when, when we were able to have canoe journey, I would make a lot of gifts for the canoe family to take because when they go to the protocol, when they visit other tribes, they gift the tribal people and thank them for hosting them to feed them and everything. 
So I make a lot of earrings and a lot of beaded ornament covers to send with them, um, just as gifting. That's so I'm retired and I have time to do this kind of stuff. And it's fun. <laughs> I can make up designs as I go. What's your favorite type of earring to make? Or what, I guess, what's your favorite beaded project in general? Do you have a favorite? Well, right now I have moved from, these are what you call seed beads that we're using now. Mm -hmm. um, I use a Delica bead. It's a very square, very flat bead that sits absolutely perfect to each other. And that's what I make my earrings with um, uh, now. Mm -hmm. is a <gasps> earring. It's all Delica beads. They're very big, oh but I made goodness. a pair of them just by looking on a Pinterest design. No way. Yeah, they're just, it's just fun to see the results. You yeah. Know? So, but um, yeah, I there... have a, a, I have like, probably 300 pairs of earrings I've made or been gifted and and I usually <laughs> save them and I give them to somebody else you mm -hmm. know it's just it's just that I don't need all this stuff but I was um I'm always gifted beads when elders pass away their family calls me up so I send them out I mail them out to tribal members that want to want to do things but don't have the finances to do it. And I'm blessed to have so much that I am just happy to share with anybody. How do all the tribal members keep in contact with each other? Do you have like Facebook groups or we like- We have a, you... a couple of Facebook groups. It's called um, Art and Wellness. My daughter leads that up. She teaches uh, culture classes. Okay. And um, then we have a Cal, it's a, Culture Canoe page on Facebook, where if there's going to be something going on, they post it on there. So tribal members will know that they, it's usually Zoom classes. Now we used to gather, but um, right now we're just doing everything Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so they can join. They just have to, uh, just like this class, they set it up and and we just all meet. And some of the, some of the people just come on just to visit you know, and yeah. that's okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people come on to learn things. And I actually, what they're really interested in doing is I have made up boxes of like what you guys were donated. I do up earring kits, uh, send them thread needles, wax, enough to make four or five pairs of earrings. And we have people that join us from New Jersey Texas, Alaska, Idaho, uh, all over the US tribal members. And so this has really made it nice for them to connect, um, even though that we're all at home and they feel a, a better connection with the tribe where we have 4,400 tribal members, but we're also dispersed. Yeah, so I didn't realize that. That was out of necessity. Our only reservation is at exit 16. Mm -hmm. And there's no housing there, it's just uh, economic development. Okay. So, and our culture department is there. We bought a houseway in the back of the property. We turned that into our cultural department. And I did some um, projects for our um, tribe and uh, sent a video on how to make necklaces. Are you done with your third hoop? Yes. And you'll go up through and come back down through that big bead and that's where you stop. Okay. And you'll find your beginning thread that you had and yes. you can uh, cut your thread off, take your needle off and cut it long enough to where you can use and tie these two threads together. And, and I do about three knots. Okay. And right under the big bead and they will just disappear into there and you won't see the knots at all. Um, some people put a dab of clear nail polish on for more security, but I feel if, if we tie it tight enough and bring it in and then clip it off, where's my scissors? And because the weight is not on that knot because it's under the big bead, 
then it should stay. Uh, I see. The first one, when you're always doing something the first time, it always takes a little longer. Like that first blue earring I showed you, that took me a few days. <laughs> but when I got to, to making the second earring, it didn't take long at all. So it's a totally different color. Go, and yeah. on this side, and then accent and 10, repeat, and then 20 up here. And I did that three times. And it's the same concept. And you can do any design that you want. With, when you have the large beads, if you don't want to do like these three down here, you could mm -hmm. put an accent, a large bead, and a little accent. Oh, yeah. Here, just like up here, mm -hmm. you could put a large bead at the bottom of the hoop as well. And just like this red one, like I said, it's just totally different. And, you know, you just uh, comes to your mind how you want to do it. Like this, I put, uh, I think I put 12 red, two yellow, one red, two yellow, and then 12. And then I just repeated it like three times. And this big bead is yellow. Yeah, that I really like too. how you can can like modify it and make different yeah different you can the same people thing. you'll be surprised how people say oh i'm gonna do this because i do these classes and then i say use your imagination and the stuff they turn out is just absolutely beautiful yeah. i have to have visual i taught myself to bead because i kept asking people could somebody teach me to bead and, and nobody had an interest and a lot of my family did not so i bought books and i just taught myself and I make regalia, I make button blankets, I do cedar weaving, you know, I do a lot of sewing like ribbon shirts. Mostly now I'm doing button vests, which is coastal. And uh, my daughter makes the designs and I make the vest and put the buttons on. Oh my so, gosh. So it's, it's just a fun collaboration. My daughter and I spend the time together to do that. And I teach drum making classes we're going to be doing a rattle making class. Um, and I just ordered a whole bunch of cedar uh, projects. And I have some real close friends out of Chehalis tribe um, out of Oakville. And I had money left in my budget because I'm the, the weavers coordinator. So because we couldn't gather. So I ordered all these basket kits. And there's some kits that they're sending me. It's like, it's a pretty tall clear glass um, vase straight up and we're going to weave cedar on the outside of it. See, this is cedar bark. This oh, is wow. the inside where you peel the bark off of the cedar tree. Somebody started this project and got discouraged. So they sent it to me. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is soak it and it's, it's real loose here. So I'm going to push it in and then I'm just going to finish weaving it. When I get the little basket done, I'll give it back to him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. These are eagle feathers on my hat. That is amazing. And then I have some just mother pro buttons on my hat. And I teach hat making as well. And it's Whoa. sort of fun. And we do cedar headbands. And, and I've got some little baskets and, and some just little flat necklaces that you can make real easy cedar Christmas ornaments, you know, they're just, you know, that's what I teach the clients. I work with the SUD and mental health clients in the tribe. And when I was able to go, we would at Christmas time would make cedar ornaments uh, and they would wow. be able to give them to their family or keep them, whatever they want to do. But it's just, it's just stuff that keeps me busy. It's you know, <laughs> my Pendleton fabric because I make Pendleton vests and, and things like that so oh my goodness it's a frog this yeah. is a long vest it's for a tall person it's a callous woman my daughter does the designs there she just does such a good job with it and, and we've done eagles we've i've got a big bear button blanket and my button blanket's red with a big black bear and it's got thousands of little tiny quarter inch buttons on it and you are so giving like it is. It's, you know, I'm blessed that way to, to be able to do that, you know, and that's why I'm in the position I'm in is, you know, I'm, I'm the speaker for the people in our tribe because I've been a tribal council member for 24 years. Um, what made you decide that you wanted to start with the tribal council? 
Well, I do. A, I've always been involved in the tribe with our health board. I'm on the health board for 30 years. Um, people just start asking me. My two sisters and nephew were all on council at one time and and uh, no longer are. And so I'm the representative for my family and my my. Uh, my theory is, is I'm here for the people, by the people. It's just like our, our big government and, and uh, just on a smaller scale sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're here, we're here to, to do a, have better life, quality of life for our members. Oh, great. Have you noticed, because your tribal members are so, like, spread out, have you noticed, I mean, because we've noticed people coming to our library programs from all over the country like it's actually it's in some ways it's been better to be able to connect virtually yeah and that's the way we are with our with our classes and our we have a, a department called member services that they help people connect with with each other with with like with our culture things or if they want to know about health care uh, housing anything like that and there has been a lot more uh, people. And we have our tribal council meetings now are all virtual. Mm -hmm. So the tribal members that live nationwide that were never able to be a part of the meetings because they had could not drive here, they mm -hmm. can now be a part of our 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 meetings. And it's all it's all political stuff and business for the tribe. Some people are not traditional, but that's out of necessity. We didn't, we were not recognized until the year 2000. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh my and God. We didn't have a reservation until five years ago. A tribal member put his own money up and bought the property there where the casino is. Oh my goodness. So, it did, so we didn't lose it. So we've been able to buy a few properties around it now, but we've got other parcels of property around the Western Washington. You know, we just bought a nine acre plot for a Cowlitz Cemetery and it's secluded on a dead end road, which I like, you know, my family, we have our own trust land, uh, our own cemetery for, I'm from the Ike Kinsaw family. We have our own plot of land that's in trust. And it's wow. been that way ever since I was little, I, I, I just know about it. So we take care of it ourselves. It's not through the county or anything. We take care of it ourselves. And um, I got a nephew that's real good about mowing and, clearing brush and keeping the driveway clear and stuff like that. So it's all, you know, we've got other pieces of property through the tribe that we need to utilize. So That's we have great. a huckleberry camp that we go up and camp up in the mountains out of Woodland, way up out of Cougar. Mm -hmm. And we have some property there that has an old school building on it that we dry camp there. And then during the day we drive up in the mountains to go pick the huckleberries. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. It is. It's fun. They're there four or five days and some of us stay behind a cook or the ones that don't want to go pick berries. I stay in camp and I teach beading classes too. And we take cedar and we make hats for everybody and just, just stuff like that, that we're going to be missing if we don't get to open up. You know, we didn't get to have Huckleberry Camp or Canoe Journey this year. We can't do drum groups. We can't gather for that. And you know, but I was just talking to a couple of my spirit brothers today and they're looking forward to August because we have an encampment on our, we have 17 acres of tribal property on the Cowlitz River and it's just, just property and a sweat lodge there and it's a big field and it goes right on the river and we, we used to go camp there for three or four days and everybody bring potluck and share and then we drum and sing and teach each other classes, you know, or whatever we had or would take stuff to, to sew leather and and we were missing that. So I said, hopefully in August, we can do that next year. We'll yeah, see that's... that by next August, you know. So. so like the traditional Cowlitz land, I mean, clearly Vancouver's in it. How, how spread out are the traditional lands? Okay. Um, Traditionally, our tribe had 1.76 million acres. Oh my gosh. It was all of Southwest Washington up to Olympia, to the Columbia River, to the Cascade Peaks, and to the Willapa Hills to the west. So it was a lot. Wow. Yeah. 
It was a lot. And the reason we weren't recognized is because when they gathered at Cosmopolis in 1853, um, our chief tore up the, they wanted a treaty to move us all up to uh, Quinault Reservation at Tahola. And our tribe refused to go. So they said we didn't exist. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was many, many years of battle to, to receive federal acknowledgement. And uh, it happened in the year 2000. And our um, chairman of our tribe for 27 years passed away in his sleep not too long after our recognition. But he was wow. able to see it. But his son is now vice chair of the tribe and, and fulfilling his dad's dreams of, of making things better for all people in our tribe. So, and, and that's, what, that's what we do is that's what we're working on is, is inclusive of people. You know, uh, people from all over the world say, we're so glad to be involved. And we have people stationed overseas in the service, people in Australia that we sent kits to that, you know, we say, invite them on Zoom. My daughter will have a, a class in the middle of the night so the ones in Australia can see, you know, and that's just what she does. Oh, so it's, it's so just great. fun, but, you know, it's frustrating that, you know, we've battled for so many years and now our tribe is growing so fast and, you know, we've got health care. We're looking for better health care. We've got huge departments. We've got an office in Tukwila. We just bought the big Girl Scout building in, um, where is it at? It's up by Stilicum. It's, it's up there. And we have an office here in Toledo. We have an office in Longview, office at the casino, and then an office in Vancouver. So we're pretty spread out. And, and I usually when we're open, I travel to all the different sites to work with the clients. And when I go to Tukwila, I stay there four or five days and they put me up in a hotel and I, and I work with clients all day for four wow. days. So, but I try to keep ahead and teach something new all the time. It sounds so. like you have a lot to teach. <laughs> I, and it's fun. And some of them are from other tribes and they're like, I'm so disconnected. How would I find my tribe? How would I find my, my family? How would I do this and that? So I can connect them to their tribes but they have to do that work, you know. Some are alienated from their own families. And I says, sometimes one person has to be the one to reach out. You can't always wait for them to do it. You're the one on, the, on the, a bad path with the alcohol and or drugs. So you have to let your family know your work you're doing. Oh, how would they know that you're doing good, you know? It's on you. It's on you to make the good decisions. You know, travel the red road, be good. So 